Back in the 70s and 80s, before the advent of VHS, chances are if you saw a classic movie, it was on the 4.30 movie. With their famous theme weeks, it was a chance to see movies you never saw and get reacquainted with some old classics. So, join us now for the 4.30 movie. Welcome to the 4.30 movie. This is Mark A. Altman, and it's an all-new theme week with Alien Invasions. And we have a very special guest joining us in just a minute. But first, let me introduce you to our regular programmers. Ashley E. Miller is a writer for such films as Thor and X-Men First Class. For TV, he's worked on such series as Fringe, Black Sails, and the upcoming Lore Season 2 for Amazon Prime. Ashley, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you. Steve Melching <laughs> is a writer for such series as Batman, The Brave and the Bold, X-Men, The Animated Series, the wonderful Star Wars Rebels, Emmy Award winning Star Wars Rebels, hopefully, and the upcoming Star Wars Resistance. Steve, welcome back. They're coming! They're coming! Okay, don't get ahead of yourself. <laughs> and uh, we have Darren Doctorman, a conceptual designer for films and TV series such as Master and Commander, the second season of Westworld, and the visual effects supervisor on Star Trek, the motion picture director's edition. And he is also the designer of fantastic logo t-shirts, now available at the 430movie.com store, where you can also access previous episodes of the podcast, also available on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you consume your podcast. What a long introduction. Thank you. Well, <laughs> and we're saving the best for last. Joining us for Alien Invasions is filmmaker, producer, director, writer, Dean Devlin. Dean, of course, is... Uh, the co-writer and producer of such movies as Stargate and Independence Day, and his new film, which uh, he uh, directed, it's a wonderful film, wonderful thriller, called Bad Samaritan with David Tennant, just came out in video stores. Are there such things as video stores? <laughs> it is actually Showing your age. <laughs> available on the for, down, a Blockbuster video is now no, is, uh, available for download, for streaming, and of course uh, on Amazon. So uh, welcome to the uh, podcast, Dean. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me on. Well, no uh, no discussion of alien invasions would be uh, complete without uh, having you as part of the invasion because uh, this is a pretty special week. I think that uh, uh, especially some of these early movies were the kinds of films that all inspired us as kids to our love of the genre. And uh, we're going to start with Monday. So uh, I'd like to go to Steve and say, what's the first film you'd like to see for Monday on Alien Invasion Week? Well, I mean, this is a film that is probably one of the ones that started off the whole genre, and it was one that had a big impact on me as a kid, and that, of course, is 1953's War of the Worlds. I mean, I, th I th don't think you can have any conversation about alien invasion films without talking about that, and... Uh, this was a movie that scared the hell out of me as a little kid watching it on television. The, in particular, the scene where the guys are approaching the landed spacecraft, waving their white flag, and that eye stalk thing comes out and disintegrates them. That that was terrifying to me. And then later in the film, when the heroes are hiding in the, was it a, a burnt out house or a mm -hmm. barn or something? And that same eye stock thing comes in looking for them. That was absolutely terrifying. And, and for a little kid with a, an overactive imagination like me, I was afraid to turn my back on the shower head in my bathroom for years. <laughs> well, never know. Like I would have to wash the shampoo out of my hair when I'm taking a bath. I'm like, I don't know, that thing's going to disintegrate me if I look away. <laughs> you know, I, it was. It had such a big impact on me, and it's just such a terrific classic film uh, of of alien invasion. Well, it's interesting because you mentioned being scared, and I have to say, I had a similar experience listening to the Orson Welles podcast. I wasn't there when it was broadcast in 1930, but in 32. Orson Welles podcast? But, yeah. The All Podcast, podcast really? The radio. <laughs> Keep podcast live. We've done a lot of these today. On iTunes. Uh, the, the, the great, uh, legendary Orson Welles radio show, and... Um, uh, you know, I couldn't imagine that anything could compete with what I conjured in my imagination, but I think the George Powell classic really does an amazing job of being scary and terrifying and imaginative. And I imagine it was a, a big influence on you, Dean, when you conceived uh, Independence Day. Well, for sure. I mean, it, it is it is the uh, it's the standard bearer. And, and you know, we, we did some pretty uh, obvious uh, 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 allusions to it. You know, for, uh, for instance, uh, you know, obviously the, the ending was that it was a virus that killed them, and that's what gave us the idea in the movie to do a computer virus to mm -hmm. be the thing that turns the tide. But yeah, I mean that that was the movie uh, um, that when I was a kid that 
first scared the hell out of me about the even idea of it. Sure. It's so funny. I've seen that movie so many times, and I love Independence Day, and I never made the connection between the biological yeah. virus in War of the Worlds and H.G. Wells' book and the computer virus. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, so. You know what? I, I didn't I'm already learning stuff. Like, of course, it's so obvious now. But, like, you know, I've known that, watched that movie for over 20 years and I never made that connection. That is Ooh, so. You dumb but, and of course, the alien in War of the Worlds, that's such a great. I mean, that hand with the little suction cups on it, right. that scared the hell out of me, too. Well, it, you know, it's the it's the famous shot of the alien uh, putting his hand over the uh, shoulder of the woman mm -hmm. that um, Spielberg uh, made an homage in E.T. Because mm -hmm. E.T. Right. does the same gesture over Elliot's shoulder, but this time he's it's come a lot for peace. It's, yeah. right, it's way <laughs> sweeter. Uh, I think that movie also made me value the cold. Uh, the common cold. <laughs> you know, every time you get a sniffle, you just say, you know what, I'm going to suck this up because someday it could yeah. save civilization. <laughs> I'm safeguarding humanity right, by yeah. incubating this virus. <laughs> you didn't feel as bad when you were, took off from school and you were home watching the fourth. Mom, I'm saving the planet. <laughs> I'm, I'm saving all these old Kleenexes just in case. Oh. Oh. Too much. Too Unexpected third act twist. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Monday, War of the Worlds, we're all agreed? Well, I, 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 I am fine with that. Oh, I'm glad to hear it. Yeah, <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm glad that you are glad. Yeah, there you go. So Tuesday, Darren. Tuesday, I'm going to go in a little, uh, you know, much later than 1953. Um, I'm going to go with David Toohey's The Arrival. Oh, oh interesting yeah. choice. Um, which is a really weird movie. Uh, it's hmm. basically about uh, Charlie Sheen. It's Charlie Sheen winning, um, <laughs> but <laughs> he's here, he's there. he's down in is it Mexico or South America? I think it's uh, Mexico. I think it's Mexico. Yeah. Um, and there's mysterious things going on. He 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 receives this strange transmission that he traces back to this uh, basically uh, power plant down in in Mexico that he finds is being run by aliens trying to take over the world. You know who I really miss who's in that movie? Now, we, we've talked about great character actors like J.T. Walsh and mm -hmm. some of these other people. Ron Silver. Yeah. Yeah. Ron yeah. Silver is so good in that movie. Yeah. And uh, he's, really, he's really missed, you know? He died way too young. And, of course, the creatures designed by our friend Patrick Totopoulos, uh, uh, who later did the uh, creatures on Independence Day. And Stargate. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. where you met him, right? Godzilla as well? Yep. Yeah. But... That is a creepy movie, absolutely, yes. and it, it 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 consistently keeps the creep factor throughout the entire thing, even when you're just looking at Charlie Sheen. Uh, but it's it's uh, it's <laughs> just creepy. It, it's kind of a it's a weird little favorite of mine. Well, I think and, and not to I don't want to you know hopefully not embarrass him, but another friend of ours, Dan Weber, said that he had a conversation uh, with Tui once and. Enthused about the film, saying it was one of the best B movies of the year, and, and he, he meant took it offense in a very at that. flattering, um, very. Uh, I mean, he was he loved that movie. Yeah, so Dan he thought loved it was it. a real compliment when he told Tui we were at a screening of yeah. the, the arrival. It was actually the Academy of Science Fiction, Fantasy, and Horror, and uh, he said, you know, I, we, he and, and Dan had just come off a season of Buffy, and you know, Dan's done a bunch of stuff. He's a writer on The Simpsons now, and he was just like, you know, I love that movie. It's like the greatest B movie ever, which it is an homage to those classic B movies like Invaders from Mars and stuff. And Tui just was not having it. But you know, he is <laughs> Tui is a really interesting filmmaker because you know if you look at his body of work he is always trying to do the a version of b movies and very right. often he's incredibly successful i think he's one of those directors um like um who i think like stephen summers can be really like good if you limit his resources um when he's constrained i think that to his creativity kicks in um so you know he'll do something great like the arrival or below which would have been a great choice uh for under our sea. under the sea well, week or pitch which black did he yeah. do or pitch a black. deep yeah. rising was that Stephen? Summers? that's that Stephen summers, summers. Stephen yeah. summers. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well my experience with david tui is that i got to work with him for like six months on um, right? chronicles of riddick yeah. and that was the most exciting and fun time I ever had working on a movie because he was constantly in the art department just hanging out and talking about ideas for the movie with us. And it was the most creative experience I've ever had uh, on a show. You know, the movie is what it is. 
but it's you know basically close up Vin and a lot of blurry stuff behind him. <laughs> but you know it, we we put a lot of work into it, and I'm proud of the stuff that we did. But uh, Tui is a lot of fun to work with, and but this was one of those times where he was not constrained at right. all, and. You know, yeah. you get yeah, that you was get. a big Universal movie thanks yep. to Vin Diesel and the success he had had with um, Fast and Furious. Uh, okay, Wednesday, um, we're t- you mentioned Creepy. Uh, I would like to, and there's so many fine choices. I, I, I guess I can't say V because it was a TV movie. Right. Um, uh, but I would say, you know, I, I was sorely tempted to go with Life Force. Um, but I can't <laughs> subject the kids to that. The nude Matilda <laughs> May, and it's really more of a it's zombie like movie than it is a alien invasion movie. And, but and and uh, of course, they live is very topical right now, um, mm-hmm. which is a great alien invasion movie. But I'm going to go with the 1978 classic Invasion oh. of the Body Snatchers. Yeah, yeah that's what oh. I was going to go with. Oh, <laughs> God. God. Yeah, that's the one, man. That's the one. Maybe you want to you want to talk about that? Phil Kaufman, uh, it's, it's brilliant, and and. The original is a classic, and and it's one of the few remakes that is as good, if not better, than the original. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I, the image of the human head on the dog. Oh my yep. god! Still, I have nightmares over that. And that was just a mask on yeah. a dog. It right. wasn't even <laughs> like any crazy visual effect. But it's it cut the cut the tongue through. It was uh, so effective. It was yeah. So effective. And to have Kevin do the cameo was amazing. Right. Oh, yeah. Kevin McCarthy from the original coming out and saying, they're here, they're here. <laughs> and then he gets hit by a car. My favorite scene in that movie, because it's such a great example of 70s paranoia. And it was right on the heels of stuff like Three Days of the Condor and the Parallax View. And, um, you know, it dealt a lot with New Age. You had Jeff Goldblum as mm-hmm. this, you know, mm-hmm. sort of ran a mud bath. It's no two-bunch palms in <laughs> San Francisco. And uh, there's that great scene where Walter Bernal, played brilliantly by Donald Sutherland, is making the phone call. And uh, and they said we'll be right there, Mr. Bennell. And he's like, "How do you know my name? I didn't give you my name." <laughs> and it's 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 so great. And then there, he's on the run with Brooke Adams, who is definitely one of my crushes of the seventies. <laughs> I just love, couldn't get enough of her. Well, it is such a gritty movie. It's so steeped in that seventies, you know, urban grind. You know, it's just that sort of darkness and and grit to it. And I was 10 years old when that movie came out, and it was my birthday movie that year. Wow. <laughs> it was wow. between that Happy or birthday, the, Steve. the animated Lord of the Rings. And <laughs> 10-year-old Steve was like, Star Wars was out the last year. Invasion of the Body Snatchers, that sounds like sci-fi. i got to see that. And so me and my little group of friends went to the mall and saw Invasion of the Body Snatchers. And we're just I, horrified. I would love to see a photo of your group of friends and you walking out of that theater (laughs) and the look on your face. My God, the last shot in that film Uh, is haunting uh, in the extreme, you know. By the way, Steve, I'm 100% convinced I was not in that movie theater with you. (laughs) No, no, I was in Hawaii when uh, when when I saw that, but... I mean, my first exposure to that film, because I was but a wee little fellow when it uh, it originally came out, was the Mad Magazine parody, Uh, (laughs) which I loved. I thought that was amazing. I couldn't wait to see the movie. And it was like, it was so different. (laughs) (laughs) Do you remember what Mad's title for it was? Because I don't. I don't either. I feel like it was Invasion of the Booty Snatchers or something like like that. that. But Mm. yeah, now I want to find out. You got to look that up. Yeah. And of course, it had Jeff Goldblum in it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and Jeff, I mean, who's sensational in your picture, but he's great in everything he does. I, I can never get enough Jeff Goldblum. <laughs> and he's, he's so good in that. And so is Veronica Cartwright, who yes. a year later would go on to do Alien. That's right. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's well, just, of course, Leonard, Leonard Nimoy. Nimoy. Oh, yeah, Leonard Nimoy. Talk about Leonard. He, you know, creepy even without being, <laughs> you know, a, a, an alien, even though it turns out like he is. But oh my God, it, it's just, it's just so strange because it's not, it's not a reality that you understand. It's like this sort of hyper real, everyone's acting very odd, even you know when yeah. they're not aliens. But Nimoy, the casting of Nimoy is so meta because Kaufman had just worked with him for months on Planet of the Titans, right. the Star Trek movie that had been abandoned, but he loved, loved Nimoy, and so he casts him in the movie, and he plays this very hyper-emotional character that gets emotions. He's a psychotherapist who right. gets by, you know, like that's where he spins Jeff Goldblum right. around and scares the shit oh. out of him to get these heightened emotions. And then when he gets turned into a pod, he's Spock. Right. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's wild. And, and Donald Sutherland is just, you know, he Perfect. was one yeah. of the biggest movie stars of that time, and he's just so great in it. And that final scene of him, you know, pointing his finger uh, mm-hmm. in front of the San Francisco City Hall with those 
denuded trees behind him. It's so creepy. It's so the scary. Screen. The screen. The screen. Screen. Ben Burt, right? Terrifying. I mean, I think he did. Yeah. Yeah. And and I'll tell you the thing about Donald Sutherland. You know, we talked about Gene Hackman earlier on uh, Under the Sea Week and how facile and what a brilliant actor he was. But you look at um, Donald Sutherland. Okay, so 1978, he's in Invasion of the Body Snatchers. An Animal House, yeah. you know, wow. and it's like he's great <laughs> in both those movies. I mean, he's great in every range. But look yeah. at the range there. Well, and you know, a couple of years before, he's in Kelly's Heroes, and he's playing a in... completely different kind of character. Yeah. Yeah. Although it would be great to see Oddball in Invasion of the Body, <laughs> <laughs> and then <laughs> Mash, the and Mash. You know, I mean, Mash, he's in Robert yeah. Altman's Mash. Oh, and what's uh, Don't Look Now? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I mean, it just Sutherland is uh, incredible, and and from what I understand. Uh, you know, a total pain in the ass to work with, but a big genre fan. Mm. <laughs> so you got to love him for that. Um, but just a fantastic movie. And if, if if there were more days in the week, I would recommend the original Invasion of the Body Snatchers as well. Right. But uh, I think we only have two more slots left. So I'm going to look to Dean for Thursday. Oh, boy. Um, I think I think considering how the week's going, I think I think we <laughs> need we need at this point uh, uh, attack the block. Oh, oh interesting. Especially because the female lead is now Doctor Who. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah right. that's right. <laughs> Always got to bring it back to Doctor Who. Everything has to go back to Doctor Who. <laughs> <laughs> you know that. <laughs> All roads lead back to Doctor Who. <laughs> that's just And the one the male lead is uh, the star of the new Star Wars trilogy. That's right. So, but that uh, that movie really kind of again talk about a B movie that 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 transcends the genre. You know, when I first heard about it, I thought, oh, this will be a fun little movie to see. And I, I really thought that it was it was transformative in that it, it, it took something that I thought I was going to know and really spun it in, in scene after scene. I, I, I couldn't guess what was going to happen next. And that's kind of hard at my age when I've seen so many different things. <laughs> yeah. You know, when you see anything where you're surprised, it really, you know, it kind of knocks you back. And it's a great um, it's a great story. It's a great movie even with I mean, even before you get to the whole alien invasion right. and like in dealing with the creatures and all that those characters are so great they inhabit this very specific world right. you know they don't live in a in a you know generic you know neighborhood where like bad things happen and the kids have to put a gang it's together the opposite to fight of the, the Spielberg uh, neighborhood right, right. Mm-hmm. it's like they seem as alien to us and as dangerous to us as those aliens are and I think the magic of that film is that um, it it, it puts us in a place where you know we we empathize with with them, like they represent us. Like, there's like this, I, I, there's something that's just transactional about it, where they just cease being different. Like the the movie spends so much time highlighting what is different and special about them, so that when the shit hits the fan, like suddenly there's just this transference, um, and we're with them, and it's just it's 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 unlike any other movie in, in this genre. In well, that way. Because they, they made a commitment to make the characters compelling, not necessarily likable. Right. You know, if, if again, you, you say the Spielberg comparison, but I would say it's just the Hollywood studio comparison. <laughs> I, I could hear the development meeting now. It's like the kids, they volunteer at the orphanage when they're not taking care of their grandmother. You know, like they're the nicest kids in the world and they have to save the planet. These kids are robbing her right, in the right. opening scene of the picture. And yet, by the end, we're rooting for them. Yeah, That's you're right. like, how am I, like, these are the heroes? I mean, God, they're dicks. Right. <laughs> you know? Like, they're going to save the earth. And John Boyega, is so he is so charismatic yes. in that film, um, and just he's so forceful and commanding. He owns that movie. It's yeah. like you see, like why he was cast in Star Wars. It's like I'd almost, I almost, I'd like to see a little more of that intensity right. um, in his in his Star Wars role. I mean, um, he's just he's great. What I love about that too is you, it shows you don't need a huge studio budget, you know, to do an imaginative, mm-hmm. you know, genre film. I mean, I think it's really a little outside. You know the box, and there are a couple of films like this. Before we turn to Ashley for Friday, which I like to think of as our honorary mentions, films that probably <laughs> don't warrant inclusion, um, but are great alien invasion movies. One of them is The Hidden, Jack Shoulders' oh, film, yes. oh, uh, great. Uh, Classic. which is a terrific movie and a perfect four thirty movie because it's the kind of um, it you know it's it's the kind of thing that you would actually expect to see yes. on the four thirty. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Well, Kyle MacLachlan, you know, is just terrific in that film. Um, and Claudia Christian is the uh, alien, and uh, and one you know because the alien is shape change. It's one of those great shape changing right. movies where it can take on different uh, different vis- visages. I mean, is it is it? I, and James I, Spader, right? It's James Spader and Colin McLaughlin, right? 
Yes, and I believe so. And it's more of a the alien is more of a was it more of a fugitive? It's more of a fugitive yeah, than, yeah, than an invader. Yeah, yeah. But um, I mean, he's on Earth but illegally causing aliens, mayhem. Right? So um, save it for Fugitive Week. What? Fugitive yeah. Week. No, no, it's a movie. And, you know, I remember uh, one of my first jobs out of college was uh, I was a PA on a movie that was produced by Gerald Olson, who was the producer of The Hidden that, that I was a big fan of. And I just remember I was working late in the office one night. And uh, I stopped by his office to pick something up, and he he looked me over and he says, "Steve, you're really wholesome." <laughs> I'm like, I didn't know what to do with that. I'm like, okay, thanks. Well, Dolly. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Um... Any other uh, other movies that maybe don't quite make the cut that well, that you would? How about something like Starship Troopers? Yeah. I mean, it's not wow. – they attack yeah. Earth. They didn't – they're on there. They're trying to invade Buenos Earth. Aires. Remember yeah, Buenos Aires. Buenos Aires. <laughs> I mean, you know, there's a lot to talk about. I'd like to know film. more. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's uh, – yeah, it's – it's it's a very odd movie. I, I, I would – classify that as a war movie rather right. than an invasion movie. But, you know, it, it is one of the great uh, combinations of CG and miniature work because mm-hmm. the spaceship stuff is mostly this great miniature work. The Valley Forge is a gorgeous miniature. And then, of course, the bugs are just some beautiful CGI right. that, uh, you know, attack on the fort is, is fantastic. That and it's Tippett, uh... vintage Verhoeven satire. And I guess it's a little less powerful because, of course, it was uh, making fun of the Bush administration, and you know now we're all pining away for the Bush administration. So uh, it, it doesn't quite pack the wallop that it once did. Is this uh, reality TV in- <laughs> alien invasion. <Yeah. laughs> um, but you know it's it's such a um, a gonzo film. I mean, it's just you know with these quote you know dreadful performances and which are sort of intentional in a way, and uh, you know it's just uh, Verhoeven. Uh, his satires are just so... And a lot of people didn't get it. They weren't in on the joke. They hated the movie. When Doogie Hauser comes out and he's wearing the Nazi jacket, it's bad! It's bad! <laughs> <laughs> would uh, would uh, Mars Attacks... Oh, absolutely. 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 Your, your uh, competition at the box office that season. Well, uh, it, actually, they, they were in production on the day that we got greenlit. So it was a race oh, to see who comes out wow. first. And we were very worried that the parody of our movie was going to come out before our movie. <laughs> it's like any movie that has Tom Jones singing in it while people are killing aliens. I, well, you can't, causing aliens you can't heads to pop, right? right? <laughs> well, it's funny because... And Nicholson we, as the president. Right. <laughs> yeah. When we did films about filmmaking week, you know, you mentioned, you know, Ed, Ed Wood. And this was sort of... Tim Burton making an Ed Wood movie. Right. Sort of Plan <laughs> 9 from Outer Space. Right. It was the film he made right after Ed Wood, I believe. Right. Uh, it, it's, it's, it, it, you know, it's a flawed movie, but there's so many great Great images. In it. Yeah, great images. And it's only appropriate because, of course, it's for, based on the trading card series, right. which may be the only time in the history of the movies <laughs> that uh, trading card series provided the IP <laughs> for something. Although I wouldn't be surprised if Netflix, you know, green lights a, you know, three season series based on a trading card yeah, series. Yeah, the garbage like... pail kids. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, it's my. like wacky packs, the series. More I'd like to see that. What <laughs> a great cast. I mean, you're right. And Nicholson playing the president. I mean, that thing, Pierce Brosnan. And playing a brilliant scientist. I mean, that was almost like the equivalent of an old Irwin Allen adventure movie because it was just packed yeah, with. Totally. I think it was one of the last times you saw on the poster where they had like the whole cast. And right. mm. it wasn't Rod Steiger. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it was kind of deeply disturbing, like in its own way. Yeah, you know, just <laughs> like just the, something about like the the, the exploding heads. Yeah. Um, that just were just unsettling. Like this, just the whole deal with the aliens. Just well, kind no of, one wants their head to explode. Nobody wants that's their head. That's what's no, unsettling. You, but if I have to go, that to that's how I want to go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, we I can make drowning. that happen. Yeah. <laughs> and I seem to remember also that, you know, it was a film where Tim Burton did not have Final Cut and him really fighting with the studio. And I think it got really um, cut up. Mm. And I would love to see, I don't think there were ever deleted scenes on the Blu-ray or any of the iterations that were on home video. That's interesting. And I'd love to see sort of his version of Mars Attacks. All right, all right. <laughs> you know a movie we, 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 we didn't mention? It's funny because we mentioned it in a lot of podcasts. Oh, boy. And you it's mentioned used. Jeff Goldblum. Okay. But how... No, 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 no. Don't, don't, don't say it because you're about to say my Friday movie. Well, maybe we should let Ashley yes, do his Friday movie, and do then Friday we'll movie. discuss yes. other alternatives if you want to swap something out. Well, we don't I, want to I, say I, everything before Ashley yes. gets a chance. Okay, okay. So, 
Um, my nomination for Friday, I, uh, I, I will I'll, I'll throw it in by asking a question first. <laughs> Where are we going? Planet 10. And when are we going there? Real, Real soon. soon. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> the Adventures of Buckaroo Banzai Across the Eighth Dimension, um, yeah. written and directed by the great W.D. Richter, who was Joss Whedon before Joss Whedon was cool, and as it turns out, after. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and if you haven't seen this film, by the way, everybody needs to see Buckaroo. Yeah, so, and Shout it's required. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's required reading at the Academy. Shout, Shout Factory put out a beautiful edition of it as well, and you know, on on Blu-ray. So if you don't see it on the 4:30 movie, you should definitely check Which out. Which has the a great audio commentary. So is, this, track. is this the second or th- no? This is the third Jeff Goldblum movie so far. And I have it, a feeling there'll be a forthcoming. Yeah. There might be more. I mean, we could talk about this movie all day. I mean, it's it's one of those things where it it certainly didn't strike a chord at the box office when it came out, although um, the studio certainly expected that it would. There was a comic book tie-in. Right. I mean, they had high hopes for this thing, and then it just kind of landed with a uh. yeah. But, you know, it it had such a, uh, a long life afterwards right. just as a cult film, like on video. Like people mm-hmm. really found it and really dug that, that sense of humor um, and just sort of the strange matter-of-factness of it. Um, I mean, uh, there are so many great moments in that film. I think uh, my favorite, and it's very simple, is when he's in the club and they're they're playing, and like it's just noisy as shit. And he says, "Wait, is there Alan Barkin?" Is... Yeah, Alan Barkin is in the back. Is someone crying? Someone crying? Someone is not no, out there in the dark? <laughs> yeah, it's just, uh, yeah, it's it's awesome. Well, followed by another just great moment when. Uh... The, the scuffle happens and suddenly all the band members are pulling out guns. <laughs> it's like that's so hilarious to me that they're all packing heat on stage. He's so quirky and weird. And it's a shame because Richter is such a brilliant writer, but not a great director. And a, clearly, you know, he, he was in a tough situation as a first time director. Because he'd written Invasion of the Body Snatchers, a lot of other great movies. But um, he was up against David Beagleman. You know, who, mm. whose company was doing this. It was a negative pickup for Fox. And so you really needed somebody who could push back. And, you know, obviously the special effects are a little subpar. Um, clearly could have benefited from some reshoots. Um, but the casting, of course, is just brilliant. And then Fox oh. buried it when they released it in 84. Right. Uh, you came and went. And, I always and, forget and, that Clancy Brown is in that movie. Yep. Clancy Brown, oh God, Jeff Goldblum, Ellen Barkin, Chris, Peter Weller. Chris Lloyd. Chris, Chris Lloyd, Lloyd. John Lithgow. John Lithgow. Yeah, it's an as amazing Emilio cast. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the, the aliens... Uh, the the black electroids and the red electroids like mm-hmm. they're just the best. Oh, and Vincent Schiavelli. It's not my damn Vincent Schiavelli. Schiavelli. Yeah. I love Vincent Schiavelli. Yeah. He's so great. Now and then, by the way, that Blu-ray edition that you mentioned has a terrific audio commentary track with uh, Earl McRoush and uh, W.D. Richter. And Richter is the writer, right? Yes, and, and the director. Well, and the director. Yeah. He was a writer. He's a very big writer in the '70s. This was his first movie he directed. Uh, and, Maybe and it was, it was Earl, and it, one of them is Earl McRoush wrote it. Yeah. Okay, and W. So, D. Richter directed and I think it. Right. Roush is in the commentary. He's in character as one of the, the documentarians of Buckaroo, of Buckaroo Bond, Bond, who's played in the film by one of the actors. Right. It's it's this weird meta commentary, but it's it's pretty interesting. <laughs> well, I remember it was kind of like the Captain Midnight Dakota Ring at the time, where you could become a Blue Blazer regular. Yeah, so, there was a fan club, and it was a join. fan club, and you'd send in, and they would send you like a button and like all kinds of weird Buckaroo Banzai swag, and it was it was kind of awesome. <laughs> and uh, you know, apparently they you know famously tried to get a television series off the ground. I think everybody about, in their what, mom about fifteen is... years ago yeah. with the original. Uh, Cats and a friend of ours, uh, Adam Mojo Leibowitz, worked on a visual the demo, of, reel. Some demo reel. Yeah, Fox effects. was going to do it. Then uh, a bunch of years later, MGM tried to do it with Kevin Smith, but they didn't have chain of title on it. Yeah, they didn't and, have the rights. And they didn't have the rights, <laughs> yeah. and they were pretty far down the road on it, so that fell apart. You think that'd be one of those top ten things you'd figure out first? Yeah. <laughs> MGM is not so great on knowing what they have in their library because they have so many libraries from bankrupted studios like Orion and right. UA and, and they all these... sold a lot of it to Warner Brothers. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so like they I think a lot of stuff they don't even have like the paperwork they have this on. big box that they had that they rifle through occasionally. Oh, didn't we used to have this? <laughs> <laughs> this uh Buckaroo Banzai has this sort of odd connection to another one of my very favorite movies of, of all time. 
um, Big Trouble in Little China. Uh, I mean, first of all, W.D. Richter wrote uh, the the screenplay for for Big Trouble in Little China, um, which is which is terrific. But at the end of Buckaroo Banzai, which for my money has the greatest like end title sequence of all mm-hmm. time, uh, you know, Buckaroo Banzai will return in Buckaroo Banzai versus the World Crime League. I mean, as I understand it. Uh, uh, Jack Burton, the hero of Big Trouble in Little China, was supposed to at least have a cameo um, in uh, in the in the next Buckaroo Banzai oh, movie, and he was supposed to be like you know one of Buckaroo's fans. He's got oh. like, and somebody said, and I haven't gone and and been, been able to verify this, but uh, somebody said that there's a shot inside the I don't know if this is true or not. There's a shot inside the Pork Chop Express where you can see a Buckaroo Banzai comic book. Oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> oh. yeah. So I, I want that to be true. I desperately want it to be true. Well, I wish your remake or your sequel, to, oh, uh, Big Trouble in Little China, that you did for Fox had, had materialized because I'm sure we would have seen some interesting homages. Uh, yes. Um, <laughs> you, can, you can count on it. <laughs> you know, it's funny because you mentioned Big Trouble in Little China. We probably should have talked about it during Sword and Sorcery Week because, of course, we had a very – um, sort of American kind of look at sword and sorcery. But, you know, if you look at sort of Eastern sword and sorcery and those kind of, you know, you could have made the case that the Wushu Big movies, Trouble yeah. the Wushu movies, that yeah. Big Trouble in Little China would have been appropriate for that. But we'll have to revisit that again because that's well, a, I almost, yeah, well, I almost brought up a yes, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, but that's <laughs> more of a... I wouldn't put that. Well, the dragon's hidden. Yes. So. Yeah, he's a you for know, East meets West. Week. Yeah, he's not very <laughs> Mathrex pejorative. Now, you know, the four thirty movie was great, but you know, there was something that was even better than the four thirty movie, which was the ABC Sunday Night movie. Uh-huh. So, you know, when you were big enough and cool enough. You debuted on the ABC Sunday Night Movie, <laughs> which was even cooler than the 4:30 Movie. But we can't call the podcast the, full, the ABC Sunday Night Movie. <laughs> so I have I, I I have a movie which I think should cap our Alien Invasion Week, which I think is the perfect, um, you know, I don't know if it's the dessert or the aperitif or the port or if it's just <laughs> the you know. The, but uh, you clearly, drunk, so you it is night. a movie that 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 pays homage to the history from H. G. Wells. Through the '50s alien invasion movies, uh, you know, through everything we we love about the genre, it's a love letter to science fiction. And of course, I'm talking about Dean's movie Independence Day, which I think is a great way to end Alien Invasion Week. Um, I think there's to- arguably no alien invasion movie that's more popular than Independence <laughs> yeah. Day. It was a seismic event. Uh, I recall. Uh, when the Academy uh, of uh, Science Fiction, Fantasy, and Horror did an early screening of it down at USC. We lined up for hours to get in there to see that, not only because it was going to be this huge event, it also had the famously the Star Wars special edition trailer right. attached right. in front of it. So it was like a one-two punch. And this was a film that gave us everything that we always wanted in an alien invasion movie. It had epic scale like we had never seen before. I mean, we had seen a taste of it in something like V, where you have the saucer sh- motherships hovering over major cities. But then Independence Day comes along and those ships are like 10 times bigger and they shoot these giant fucking laser beams that incinerate (laughs) entire cities. And And the the White House. Where are they now? (laughs) (laughs) And fighter jets Uh, battling like, you know, alien spacecraft. It's just it's like every like 12 year old. Like It checks every box that you wanted to see in an alien invasion movie in such a satisfying way. And talk about a great cast. I mean, you know, the cast is iconic from Will Smith to Jeff Goldblum to... Um, well, like Bill Pullman. Bill Pullman a, is a president the, who can actually give a speech. One of the greatest <laughs> filmic presidential speeches I think we've ever seen. Well, my favorite actor in it is actually the... Um, you see on TV the Russian translator from the news, uh, the news uh, t- talking about the clouds appearing. That's me, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I knew that. Yes, no, right? it's, it's absolutely true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I recorded for Ed Marsh, who was doing oh, all the fantastic. videos. Oh, yeah. my gosh. That's, That's just terrible. terrible. I love that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea. <laughs> well, uh, 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 so um, George Putnam. Was mm-hmm. was one of the news broadcasters, yep. and I wanted to cast a different news broadcaster. And when I re- made the request, George Putnam came out of my mouth. But I was thinking of a totally different guy. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh my god! So when George Putnam showed up on set, I was like, "Wait a oh, minute! Oh crap!" <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> but he was all right. He was all right. Yeah, that wasn't true. who I, I had a whole other guy. Hal Fishburne is who I had in my head. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it was funny because V had um, Howard K. Smith. And, right. and that was like before now everybody has CNN and Wolf Blitzer and everything, right? And, and it's so interesting to see how now real newscasters, you know, do it. And it gives it such an honesty and a truthfulness. So to... Howard K. Smith is in V and Close Encounters? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, right. yeah. Oh, yeah. Don't you remember mm-hmm. Howard K. Smith? You know? I don't remember him in V. He, he was good in wow. V. I do a whole yeah. show about He's no Wolf Blitzer. No. He's no George Blitzer. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, 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 it's interesting, too, I imagine, because here you made a movie that's an homage to the movies you grew up with. And now there's a whole generation that they know Alien Invasion movies as Independence Day. That's the movie they grew up with. That must feel strange. It's 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 great. You know, I mean, look, the the movie was very obvious in tipping its hat to the movies that came before it. I mean, we weren't subtle about it. The spaceship in the clouds looked very much like the spaceship in Close Encounters. The aliens looked very, you know, we weren't trying to pretend that we were inventing it. We wanted it to be something special for people who like these movies. Like when the laptop goes on and says, good morning, Dave. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and, and the more people kind of who found those things, the more they enjoyed the, the film. Um, but it is interesting today when I'll talk to, to some people and they'll think that we invented it. And I'll have to say, no, no, you need to go watch a bunch of other movies first. Yeah. Uh, because th- there's there's a continuity to this stuff, and I think it's it's good to know. I think it makes it more enjoyable mm-hmm. when you know where it comes from. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, and and look, you did invent one trope, which is never kill the dog. <laughs> 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 you know. Although I, I we screened here last night. Um, the Toxic Avenger. And I forgot that they killed the dog in Toxic Avenger. Man, is that a hard movie to watch. <laughs> Not just for that John reason. Wick. Right. Mm. Right. Met the aliens who killed John Wick's dog. Totally different film. <laughs> <laughs> he would have single handedly <laughs> ended the alien invasion. Well, that's going to be John Wick 4. <laughs> right. Um, I actually saw I, Independence Day was the first movie that I saw as a married man. Uh, I was, God, watch me. F up my uh, my anniversary. Um, <laughs> I was married on I think June. God, is that my wife's birthday or is that <laughs> June twenty ninth? We'll uh, edit this later if you got it wrong. Nineteen ninety six. And we went on our honeymoon. Redacted. And while we were on our honeymoon, I'm like, we've got to go see Independence Day. Like we've we've got to go. So we interrupted the honeymoon to go see Independence Day. And uh, I, I it was honestly. I prop now. Admittedly, this is this is because I I was drinking through a lot of the honeymoon. But <laughs> but Independence Day is like one of the things I remember best about the honeymoon. Clearly, it's more like, than the anniversary date. <laughs> right? Exactly. And I I'm hope your wife this is never listens to this podcast. Is put this into like her divorce papers. But <laughs> <laughs> I, I wish Independence Day was my first film as a married man. Because my first film was a married man was Will Ferrell's Land of the Lost, oh, wow. which was oh. terrible, inauspicious, my friend. <laughs> but I, I, I'll tell you, for for me, the the best part of Independence Day was the promotional tour afterwards Mm. because Fox put us on the road for three and a half months going all around the world opening the picture. Mm. And first of all, I hadn't traveled the world before. You know, I'd been to some place, but not much. But here we were going to every single country opening the movie. And what was so remarkable is that we would go to a country that felt completely alien, that like I felt like I was on another planet. And yet the audience laughed in the same place, Mm. cheered in the same place. And and it made me feel at the end of that tour that that the essential message of the movie was that we're one race, the human race, was 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 essentially really really true, and and I, I had come out of that tour with such a, a feeling of empathy like I'd never felt before, and I, you know you realize that the things that that connect us are far greater than the things that separate us, and you know not to go off on a side ramp, but we do feel like we're living in a time where everything is trying to divide us. Mm-hmm. And I think it is good once in a while to remember, you know, we're, we're all in, in this – we're all on this, this, this spaceship called Earth with this very thin thing around it that's protecting us. And uh, uh, that's all we've got is each other and, and the atmosphere. <laughs> <laughs> and well, sometimes we need to listen to the crazy guy in the crop duster. That's right. <laughs> which, well, was awesome, Canada, by the way. Which, which wasn't a crop duster by the time you were done with it. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, because uh, uh, I because I, I bashed studios earlier. I'm, I'm now going to give a compliment. Uh, uh, that movie, because uh, we spec'd it, 
we had a, a, a bidding war for the movie. So, so nine studios. There was nine studios back then. Mm-hmm. They all were trying to get the movie. So when we closed the deal, we had unprecedented. Not only did we have total creative control over the movie, we had creative control over the marketing. That never happens. I don't think it ever happened before. I don't think it's ever happened since. Um, but we did say, look, we'll listen to notes, but it's our decision whether we do them or not. And so the very first meeting, uh, uh, nobody at a higher level wanted to give notes. So it was a little, uh, you know, a, a lower level CE came in to, to give his notes. And he goes, I only have one note. I think that the, the alcoholic guy, Crop Duster, he's alcoholic because he had been kidnapped by aliens and no one believed him. And Roland and I were so ready to fight him on that one. Well, actually, that's a really cool idea. <laughs> that's a really good idea. <laughs> so I have to give, you know, Jorge Saralegi was the guy who came up with that. That's and so, uh, so he was right. <laughs> well, I have to say, I mean, there's so much I love about that movie. But what Dean said is is true. I, I think the, 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 the greatest thing that comes out of it is that inspirational message of all the countries working together. And only yeah. together can they defeat this alien invasion and um, to see the Israelis and the Arabs, you know, flying off together and, uh, you know, these these, like these flying pe- into this hopeless battle. against it, this. It's such a great yeah. uh, message. And I think it's more again relevant today than ever. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's one of the great things. And that, that's so different, I think, because you really see in the previous alien invasion movies that kind of American exceptionalism where only, you know, America can solve you know the the problem you know the world's like problems the against the aliens <laughs> and 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 here you know here you have you know the whole world coming together which is uh which i think is terrific and why it played so well and was such a blockbuster around the globe um well, which it's is funny really you cool. say cuz cuz that was the message of the movie but yet when we were going on that international tour uh, uh, the press would constantly say isn't this movie just about how america has to save the world and then i would go into this long diatribe about no this is the exact opposite about us coming together so anyway as i said this was a long tour and we finally ended up at the deauville film festival and it was a big kind of press conference with hundreds of reporters and roland and i were exhausted from this tour and again the first question is a a a snarky french uh, reporter who says isn't it true this is just trying to say america has to save the world and i said well you know normally i answer that question differently but considering we're here on the shores of normandy <laughs> and and after the laughs died down roland said yeah my father was here once but you made him leave well i have to say what a perfect way to end alien invasion week <laughs> are there a- any other films we're missing that so, you... uh, there's there's i think there's a few a couple crazy ones like i will throw in a, a Star Trek film. Uh, Star Trek First Contact mm-hmm. is technically an alien invasion That's true. film. That's true. Because the Borg are coming for Earth. Mm. And, uh, As opposed you know, to the whales in Star Trek Four. That's right. Well, see, the that probe, wasn't really, yeah. that was a probe yeah. looking for more <laughs> whales. Why they were probing us for whales, I don't know. <laughs> uh, the Borg wanted to invade and assimilate Neither us. did Randy Quaid. That's right. <laughs> uh, Dark City is mm. technically an alien invasion mm. film, although it's okay. post- Invasion. Sure. Spoiler alert! Yeah. And, and while we're on the Jeff Goldblum run, Earth Girls Are Easy. Oh, oh yeah. Yes. <laughs> Earth Girls Are Easy, absolutely. My goodness. Well, that, the Day the Earth Stood Still. Oh, or, yeah. yeah. Wow. How do we classic. miss that? Classic. Um, the original. The original. Not the original. Will not speak of the original. Nobody A, B, C. You know, I, it's funny you mentioned The Day the Earth Stood Still because, I mean, I grew up watching that on things like the 430 movie and um, – you know, that's when I first saw it, and I absolutely adored that movie. Uh, everything about it—the robot, the um, Michael Rennie—and uh, and and just thought it was a remarkable film. Also, with a very, I think, great message at its heart. And yet, that's a film that really, I I think, has been lost from sort yeah. of the conversation. Mm-hmm. People don't know it, don't watch it. It's not, you know, that was a legendary science fiction film. I mean, it was considered a, a true classic along with Forbidden Planet. And as the generations age out of it, you don't hear people talking about that movie anymore. And and that's a real shame because I think that's a, you know, a, a pretty terrific movie. Absolutely. Maybe for Killer Robots Week we'll <laughs> bring it out. Signs. Signs, yeah. Right. Okay. Oh, yeah, that's, of course. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, why invade a planet that's 75% of, you know... 
a substance that kills you on contact. <laughs> I, 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 I don't it's know. In the Let's air. go invade. It's in the sky. Jupiter. I just yeah. like that, that the alien could, could go across galaxies to get to Earth but couldn't get out of a pantry. Right. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> pantry door. That's what stopped you. <laughs> Damn it. Oh, curse your, your low tech. <laughs> Well, you have something like District 9. Um, oh, I'm not necessarily an invasion, more right. of a... Accidental. Ac- yeah. <laughs> a breakdown on the side of the road. Visit. Or <laughs> because there is the subgenre of the alien abduction movie, which is different than the alien invasion movie. Right. And we've seen a lot of those. And then or Close Encounters of the Third Which nine, is an alien uh, uh, comes to get Richard Dreyfuss movie. It's uh, <laughs> different. E. Again, not, not invading, but I mean... It's kind of a dating but, movie. Like seeing how they would vibe. It was like alien Tinder. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you know, you know, messages. See who comes. (laughs) This means something. This is important. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Pacific Rim. I mean, they're more from another dimension, right? It's still alien. They're aliens. but Stretching also not, a little bit, though. Not yeah, my favorite little... films of all time. Oh, and then you have those Godzilla movies where it's the alien. Oh, like, isn't Mecha Godzilla right. um, King Ghidorah an alien? Uh, uh, so if... many of them are about alien invasions. Uh, Godzilla versus Megalon. Um, I mean, I, all of a sudden I'm going to show up my my Godzilla nerddom, but but alien invasion is typically at the heart of a Godzilla movie sure. that is not just Godzilla killing a lot of shit. Well, um, uh, Gamera versus Gauss is it being invaded by uh, two little um, Japanese aliens. So That's true. That's that's fun. They that's, that's alien. Now, if you would put those in Godzilla, the little guys, <laughs> <laughs> well, we tried to, but they felt too much like raptors. <laughs> Oh, there's the blob. Oh, of course, yeah. Oh, right. Yeah, a blobby a invasion. Uh, a blobby invasion. <laughs> and, you know, Chuck Russell's remake is not a terrible remake. No, it's not. Of, of, of that. It's that. pretty good. Um, or there's the Slytherin. deeper cut. You go to the Quatermass yes. uh, movie. Yes, Quatermass right? in the Pit, which is mm-hmm. awesome. Um, and it stuns me nobody's tried to remake it. It's uh, And for those of you at It doesn't home, fit on a marquee. It doesn't. <laughs> and, and, you know, um, when you're doing video on demand, it's a queue. It's too low down on the queue, you know. <laughs> right. But, it's, but Should... it's a great setup. It's you know, it, Basically, the premise is that uh, uh, we discover this, uh, this crashed Martian ship um, underneath this London tube tunnel. And when it gets opened... Uh, it the the aliens activate like this ancient ancient genetic programming in the minds of like of many people and turn us basically into rage monsters and so the uh, the alien invasion is it's really us mm. um, and it's just it's a it's a great weird like scary little movie the the Quatermass movies just in general were just really great and really worth a watch mm-hmm. the thing. The oh, thing. Yeah, for sure. Is that John yep. Carpenter? And I guess if we got something them, to yeah. show each other. Yeah. You know, the uh, Christian Nyby uh, version, Howard Hawks version, as right. the case may be. Another film that's sort of gotten lost a little right. bit. Um, and the brilliant John Carpenter remake. What a great idea. Um, and, and it starts with a flying saucer. Well, and there's also Steven Spielberg's War of the Worlds. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You yeah. know? I mean, that that is... Uh, as well crafted as as it is, it seems like there's something missing from it that made us forget it. Mm. Yeah, like it's not it great. I think, <laughs> honestly, I think it it has a lot to do with Tom Cruise not being uh, believable as an ordinary guy working on the docks. Mm. I think that might have something to do with oh, that's it. That's interesting. Also, I, I mean, for me, I, I did not love that movie, and as much as I love Josh Friedman, who's one of the the writers of that film. Um, you know, I just felt like things happened because the aliens were dumb. Like I, I couldn't quite get my head around them, like coming across galaxies, and let, yet they're having, uh, they're getting fooled by what they get fooled by, like in the farmhouse when they're looking mm-hmm. around forever. It just, I, I mean, I, I just could not, I, I couldn't make the connection. I had, I had similar problems with um with Pacific Rim and the sense that when you go to the trouble of, uh, you know. Uh, explaining shit you know like why things work in a certain way like in a science fiction film and you're telling me when you do that that it's super important that i should pay attention it needs to hold water right it needs to actually hold up because i'll go with you on almost anything um as long as like you're not you're not asking me um to believe something that simply doesn't 
doesn't actually connect and doesn't actually work. Yeah, if there's an internal consistency, I mean, that film has some great set pieces in it because uh-huh. Spielberg is, yeah. uh, of course, he's an incredible Spielberg. filmmaker. It's he's a never, pastiche yeah. of virtuoso set pieces, but it's not cohesive. Yes. So you have the great train scene, you have the, but it doesn't and hold the initial together. Initial invasion scene and that sound, that horn yep. that mm-hmm. it makes when it's, uh, and and the ending I always found kind of unsatisfying too because it just felt. False. But, but I want to just go back to something you said a second ago because I, I, I want to disagree with it slightly in that I think that if we wanted to put our heads together, there literally isn't a movie we couldn't rip apart. Oh, sure. You know absolutely. what I mean? Yeah. And I think the thing is it's the magic trick of it. In other words, what, what makes us forgive those inconsist- inconsistencies is fun. That's right. When we're enjoying something so much, we just say, ah, forget <laughs> it. Fine. Yeah. And I think maybe for me <laughs> – because I, I, I was in awe of that movie from a from a technical point of it, sure, filmmaking yeah. point. Sure, but I, I like everyone here. I don't remember it that well. Right, yeah. and I think part of it for me is it wasn't fun. Right. I wasn't yep. enjoying that adventure. I, I, I and it wasn't scary enough for me to be terrified of it and remembering right. it like in a traumatic way. Right. So I was I was experiencing it, but I I wasn't enjoying it, and because I wasn't enjoying it, the inconsistencies I think became. Mm. Totally. It's like, you know, um, Spielberg will talk about, um, you know, logic, uh, plot logic versus visceral logic a mm-hmm. lot. And, you know, what he means by that is there are things that the audience will accept in a film that don't make a hell of a lot of sense if you kind of break them down um using the logic of of structure and plot. But because the audience um, is engaged in this emotional transaction with the film, because the audience is having an experience, um, there are not only things that the audience will go with, there are things that the audience will prefer. And those are the things that the audience remembers. And for a director and a storyteller who is as gifted as Spielberg is um, at connecting with us on this visceral level, I think War of the Worlds falls apart because War of the Worlds never connects with us on a visceral level. It only really makes an effort to connect with us on an intellectual level. I mean, in spite of all of the great set pieces, it's That's so we forget it. Analysis. I think a lot of it also, and I, I just when you were talking, I, I realized it myself. There is a lot more effect in the movie than cause. They mm-hmm. show you the effect rather than what got you there. Right. And it term, I think that when you're watching a movie, the enjoyable part is seeing what happens. Mm-hmm. You know, it's anticipating a, it, it's what's a, going to happen. And it's then a, seeing it's a it, yeah. visual medium that you need to see what happens. And if if you're just seeing, if you're just walking out into the midst of a plane crash that crashed while you were sleeping, it's not. It's not something that is, you know, it's not enjoyable to see a plane crash, but it's <laughs> visceral. It's right, visceral right, to right. experience it. And if you don't experience it, you don't feel that. Right. Right. See, you buy Tom Cruise as the world's greatest bartender, but you <laughs> don't buy him as a construction worker. No, it's a true. fine line that's to true. walk. If you were the, cocktail, you have no problem with. If, if Tom Cruise and Cocktail were in War of the Worlds, <laughs> much better. Yeah, that would have been a great, you know, I'd like to see the Cocktail Cinematic Universe. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, if you're talking about Spielberg. It reminded me of that famous story, uh, I'm sure you guys know it, about, you know, uh, the fight with him and Peter Benchley about the oxygen tank in Jaws, mm. you know. Uh, uh, as the story goes, uh, Peter eventually was furious because in the book there was no oxygen tank that explodes. In fact, at the end, the shark goes down and takes the hero down with him and they die together kind of like the end of Moby Dick. And Spielberg puts in the, this air tank that's going to explode and there's a huge fight between B- Peter Benchley and, and Spielberg and, and Benchley says, you know, air tanks don't explode. When you shoot an air tank, air goes out of it. And Spielberg said <laughs> – this is a special air tank. <laughs> and, and eventually basically distanced himself from the film. And he said, you know, he, like he's done with it. And he walked away. But when the film was finished, Benchley had in his contract a screening of the movie. So he had the screening and all of his friends came and they were all divers. And he was so uptight about the ending, he wouldn't even sit in the theater. So he was out in the lobby. And just at the end, he opened the door and he peeked in. And, of course, everybody cheered when the thing blew mm-hmm. up. And, the, and he picked up the phone and he called Spielberg and went, you're right. <laughs> 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 it's, it's that movie logic. You buy it because they set it up, you know, be careful with those things. They'll blow up. That's right. <laughs> it feels right. It and feels it right. Fe- yeah. What you feel in a movie is what you take away from it. Yeah. You, you right. know, that was another movie we missed for Under the Sea Week, The Deep. The yeah. Deep. Yeah. 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 You know, Just for Jackie Bissett. I yes, exactly. That. <laughs> and Robert Shaw. 
But uh, more for, for exactly Bassett. the same reasons. <laughs> <laughs> um, they both look great in a bikini. So Monday, uh, War of the Worlds, the original. Tuesday, the arrival. Wednesday, Invasion of the Body Snatchers, nineteen seventy-eight. Thursday, Attack the Block. Friday, The Adventures of Buckaroo Banzai Across the Eighth Dimension. And Sunday on the Sunday Night Movie. Tonight on the Sunday Night Movie. Capping it all off. <laughs> Independence attack. Day. Independence Day. <laughs> <laughs> it's the end of the world, or is it? <laughs> Find out Monday. <laughs> well, look, this has been great, and I hope you'll uh, join us next week for an all-new uh, 4.30 movie. Uh, special thanks to uh, everyone. Um, and if people have uh, their own uh, films that they want to suggest or want to continue the conversation on social media, they can reach you. Where, Steve? At Stephen Melching on Twitter. Darren? At Darren Doc, one R on Twitter. Ashley? At Ashmaster Zero. And Dean? Uh, at Dean Devlin. And uh, I'm at Mark A. Altman on Twitter and Instagram. I want to remind you that my new book, So Say We All, is available at bookstores everywhere in Oral History of Battlestar Galactica. And I hope you will check out Dean's terrific new movie, Bad Samaritan, available on home video and, <laughs> and for digital download wherever uh, movies are sold. Um, and if you're a Thriller fan or a Hitchcock fan or a David Tennant fan, you should not miss this movie. And, of course, check out our website at 430movie.com where you can get all this great 430 Movie swag and also listen to previous episodes. And a very special thanks to our engineer, Bill Ritter, for making this all possible. And, of course, Dean Devlin for providing the beautiful Electric Studios for us to record our podcast. Thank you, Dean. And thank you for being with us for a terrific show today. Thank and, you. And uh, I hope to have you back if uh, you ever uh, feel the urge to uh, revisit the 430 movie. <laughs> Anytime you like. <laughs>